All right. Good evening, everyone. And uh, welcome to the first night of the Serpentine Prophecy. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is uh, Jonathan Burnett. I'm one of the uh, pastors here at North Shore Church. And I want to invite you, if you are sitting more than halfway back, I want to invite you to come forward because I don't want you to miss anything. I showered today, especially for this moment, uh, so you, you can get close without being afraid. And um, we're going to have a, a wonderful time here uh, this evening. Just to let you know a little bit uh, about the format, what's going to happen is we're going to, in a few moments after we pray, we're going to watch a, a presentation on the screen. Um, and if you've seen the trailer, then you know that uh, it's a very interesting and mysterious topic. And uh, tonight is about room 217. I can't give away too many secrets, but room, there is a room 217 that has some very interesting things. We're going to be talking more about that. After we have the presentation, uh, you will be given uh, a study guide, and we're just going to have a discussion together on some of the things that we, that we saw. We're going to read some things from Scripture, and then we're going to end. And at the end, there will be some refreshments. Uh, feel free to refresh yourselves. And uh, just in case you need to while you're here, if you need to use the facilities, as you go out of this door, you turn left, you go up a few stairs, and you'll find the, the men's room and the women's room along the corridor uh, if you need to do that. Um, so with that said, I'm going to bow my head, and we're going to uh, have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for bringing us here to the start of this event. It's something that we've been praying about, something that we've been excited for, and now we are here, and we're so glad for everyone who's come out, um, for those who may be connecting online. We just ask that as we delve into this topic, not only might it be interesting to our minds, uh, but that your spirit might speak to our hearts and give us the peace that we're all looking for. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. Does Sean ever make it out of room 217? We'll have to come back tomorrow to find out. But before we let you go, some of my friends are going to distribute a study guide to you. Um, if you need a pen, there are some pens uh, uh, knocking around. Um, and we're just going to take a few minutes to discuss a few questions together. And I want this to be interactive. There'll be some things on the screen. Um, but she will also have uh, the opportunity to uh, talk with us. Oh, okay, we swap. Yep, that's the way around we want it. Hmm. Okay, perfect. All right. So um, let me see if I can get uh, my friend Blessing. Can you help us uh, with distributing some of these things? Thank you so much. You can, you can grab some from uh, OT, and let me see if I have another friend who can, who, can help, who can help me. Let me see. My friend Amos, would you be willing to help us uh, pass out these guides? Thank you so much, friends. That's, that's awesome. Make sure that you go in. Do you have a pen? If you don't have a pen, raise your hand, and someone will bring a pen to you. You want, a, you want a pen? Okay, there's someone who needs a pen down here. My friends at the back who have the pens, if you bring the pens, that's awesome. Keep your hand up. I know it's, we're living in 2022. Who brings a pen to anything anymore? You know what I'm saying? It's intelligent people like Mary do. But for the rest of us who need a pen, uh, keep your hand raised. We'll get you a pen. We want you to be able to, to, to take notes uh, for yourself and uh, to... Um, to make sure that you have it. Okay, okay, there are a few pens coming around. If we run out of pens, apologies. Um, we will try and make sure we have more pens by tomorrow um, evening. So, the first question is just a discussion question. So, as we're looking for the pens, uh, we, we can talk about it. So, sometimes 
uh, the findings of archaeologists reveal that our ancient ancestors weren't as primitive as we supposed. Why do you think many people automatically assume that we are more advanced than our ancestors simply because they lived in a previous era? Can you think of ways in which perhaps our ancestors were more correct than we are today? You have that same question right there in your study guide. Who, who has an opinion? Who has something to share? Why do you think that many people automatically assume that the people who lived 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years ago were more primitive than we are? Who, who has, who has a, a, a reflection on that? Why do you think people often assume that? I'm going to come to someone on this side. You seem to be the most intelligent side of the room. No disrespect. No disrespect to this side. You're the smartest side of the room. This is the most intelligent. Someone over here. Why do you think that people often assume that the ancient peoples were less intelligent, were more primitive than we are? Why do you think that's the case? Thank you. My friend here, what do you think? Because of our technology. Right. Th that's a great answer. Our technology. We seem to have advanced technology today, so perhaps that makes us think we're, we're more intelligent or smarter. Someone over here on, on the smarter side of the room, a, a question about this. Why do you think people perhaps today think that we are more advanced than them? Maybe how they look. Okay. Yeah, how, how they look, the way that we have seen depictions of them. Okay, we have another friend over here. Yes, what do you think? Because we just advanced. Because we're just advanced. Said with all the confidence of youth. We're better because we're just better. Fantastic. What do you think? Why, why do you think, friend, that we might assume that we are, they were more primitive than we are? Uh, a lot of things. Uh, for instance, the way uh, they lived in the past, you know, before they start building houses, so we live in a better houses, drive cars instead of boogies and all that stuff. So we think that we got everything. <laughs> yeah, that, that certainly makes sense. Can anyone think of some ways, I'm gonna come to you friend, maybe you can help me with this next question. Can anyone think of some ways in which perhaps the ancients were more correct than we are or, or had things uh, more together or put together than we are? Can you think of any ideas? I'm gonna come to my friend and I'm gonna come back to you right, right at this moment, yes. Well, as someone said, we think we are, we seem to be more advanced, but we fail to realize that many of these theories and um, other ideas we use today are derived from them. That's, that's very, very interesting. So many of the things that we depend on actually came from the ancients. We've just built on them, so maybe they were more you know, correct than us if we are building on what they put down. Uh, so maybe that shows that they, how about you? Well, after visiting uh, places like Egypt and seeing these huge stones and these things that are made, uh, it's, it's so marvelous that uh, we can't figure out how they did it, you know? How do you move all those stones to make a pyramid? Even with our technology today, we would struggle to construct some of these great things from the past. So that perhaps lets us, gives us this idea that maybe they had something that we, uh, we may have lost or forgotten. Yes. Um, I look at the fact that many of the ways that we have our politics and our arts and the things that we teach were created around the time period of these civilizations. Right, so, so the principles of our politics, of our art, us came and were created at that time period. So one more friend before we go into question two. Pastor, nothing is built out of nothing. Nothing comes from nothing. So we are building on what was there before. Let's look at question two. Egypt was a highly advanced civilization. In some ways, it became the cradle for the Israelite nation. Uh, slavery in Egypt was at least a formative influence on the mindset of the Israelites. What does Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 to 29, reveal about the nature of this ancient empire as compared 
to the worldview of the children of Israel. So if you have access to a Bible, some of you may, may have bought it, you may have it on your phone. The verses will be on the screen as well. But if you have access to a Bible, you can go to Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to look at verse 24 to 29. And um, I'm going to see if there's someone here. It's on the screen as well, but is there someone here who's willing to read it in a nice, clear voice for me as we reflect on this question? How does the Egyptian worldview compared to the Israelite worldview. Yes, thank you. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This, uh, these verses that we just read speak about Moses, uh, who was the, the, the pioneer, one of the great founders of the Israelite nation who led them out of Egypt. What was Moses' experience or what was his um, reaction to the Egyptian culture and ideas? Was he uh, broadly in favor of them? Was he someone who said, this is how we have to build this new society? Or did he challenge or reject some of those things? What did we just read? What did it say? Yes. He rejected it. He rejected it. He rejected it. In fact, it suggests that he had an opportunity to have great wealth uh, to enjoy the, the, the pleasures and, and the passing pleasures of sin in Egypt, but he rejected it uh, rather than accepting it rather to suffer affliction with the people uh, of God. And um, yes, it says that he, he esteemed suffering for Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. So here is the, the founder of the uh, Israelite uh, people, um, and he was not somebody who uh, subscribed to these Egyptian ideas. So, as we continue with our, our study and as we continue with this, uh, the Serpentine Prophecy, we're going to discover that the Bible's picture of reality and the picture that has come down to us through our societies, influenced by Egyptian and other pagan philosophies, they differ uh, substantially. All right, let's keep moving. Okay, so question three. We're almost halfway through. The writings of Hermes Trimagistus. Wow, what a, that's a mouthful. Try saying that three times before breakfast. <laughs> and other ancient pagan luminaries exist that God's thoughts permeate the universe as a kind of mist before anything material was created. In some regards, there is some slight agreement with the perspective of the Bible regarding God's place in the universe. What do the following texts reveal about the nature of God and creation? So, uh, this individual that was discussed in the video, his idea that has influenced Greek philosophy and come down to our day is that everything in the beginning was just the mind of God in this like mist in the universe. And then out of this mist came uh, humans and, 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 and physical reality. What does the Bible have to say? So, first we're going to look at Psalms chapter 90, verse 2. Psalm 90, verse 2. Is there somebody who wants to read Psalm 90, verse 2? I'm wondering if I can get one of my very intelligent young friends, someone under the age of 15, because we all know after 15, you start to, intelligence-wise, just starts to take a nosedive. But anyone under the age of 15 who's willing to read uh, this verse for us? Psalm, oh, see, I... I knew you were smart from, from just the moment I glimpsed you. Yes, read it for us. Before the mountains were brought forth, or, or even ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Excellent. Thank you. So according to Psalms chapter 90, verse 2, did God exist before ever the world was formed or the creation of the mountains? Yes. So the Bible does teach that God came before the creation. It wasn't that somehow matter was there and eventually life came from that. God was first. Let's go, though, to the next verse, Proverbs 8, 22 
to 30. Proverbs 8, 22 to 30. Who can uh, help me reading some of this? We might not read it all because of time, but who, has, who can help me with Proverbs 8, 22 to 30? I'm looking at the, the most intelligent side of the room right here. So I can see some of you saying, please let me read. And the way I know that you're saying that is that you are actively avoiding my gaze. That's how I know you really want me to come and give you the mic. Okay, I'll read it. It says, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way. This verse is speaking about wisdom, kind of a metaphorical use of this concept uh, to describe the way in which God made things. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old. I have been established from everlasting. The wisdom in the mind of God is before uh, his works of old. From the beginning, before there was ever an earth, it says, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. And it continues. Here is the point that these verses are making. Before the world was made, indeed, the wisdom of God, the mind of God, was certainly there. We're going to continue to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. This is a short one. So if you're like, I don't want to read, but, but not too long, then this is the verse for you. Colossians 1, 15. Who wants to read this one for us? Oh, thank you. Thank you, friend. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Excellent. This is speaking of Jesus. What is it saying about him? Is, is, is God before creation or after creation, after the creation of matter, according to this? Before. So, in this sense, the teachings of Hermes, the Hermetic teachings, and the Bible somehow align. Both agree that before any physical matter was there, God was there. Now, why is this an important point? In our world today, many people believe and many people teach that first was the material world and then eventually consciousness evolved. But according to the Bible, and even according to the ancients, that does not seem to be the case. So, he was the one who created all things, and by him they were made. All right. We're going to skip Micah. Let's go to question four. You can read these verses that are there in your study guide. If you would like to go home and read them more yourself, I encourage you to do so. Okay, question four. The ancient Egyptians and Greeks came to the conclusion that because God's thoughts are pure and the physical world is imperfect, then the physical world must be a mistake. That was what they came to believe a downgrade from what should have been a purely spiritual existence. Let me say that one just a little bit clearer. The ancients believed that the pure state, the, 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 the uh, ideal state is the spiritual one. And the physical state is like a downgrade. It's this temporary downgrade. Uh, that's what they understood because, of course, they looked around the world, they saw problems, and they thought, well, God is pure, so this must be some kind of mistake. But what does Genesis chapter 1, 26 to, to 31, how does it come to a different conclusion? Is there anybody who'd be willing to read this for me? I'll read it for myself. That's okay. It says, then God said, let us make man how? In our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image, in the image of who? The image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply fill the earth, and subdue it. So, what do these verses teach us? I'm not sure why my clicker has stopped uh, clicking here. Okay, yes. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food, and also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, 
and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life. I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was what? Very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So according to these verses, the creation of human beings, the creation of our physical world, is it a mistake? Is it a downgrade from the spiritual realm? No. It is God's intended design, and he said it was very very good. So the Bible differs here from from Hermes. There there is some agreement. Yes, God was before everything, but after that, we start to go in different lines, different lines. This is not a mistake, our world and our life. So question five, we've only got two more left. Question five, philosophers like Plato could point to the suffering and the imperfections of our current world as proof that physical existence was not desirable. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where someone that you love is sick, or you find that you have some pains or some illnesses, uh, and you might start to question, man, why is the world this way? Why is there suffering? Why is there death? What kind of a good God would allow this to happen? Well, the ancient philosophers also wrestled with this idea. If God insists that his creation was good, as we just read, and it was the work of Christ himself. We read some of those verses. How do we account for the hardships associated with living on this planet? So if God is good, and he made the world good, why are things bad now? Let's look at what uh, this has to say. We're going to go forward through some of these verses and and hit on Genesis chapter 3. Okay, Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 to 19. Here's what the word says. It says, Then... To Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it, then what's that next word? Cursed is the ground for your sake, or in other words, because of you. So God is explaining to Adam, because of some choice that you have taken, Now something is going to happen to the physical world that you're living in. It wasn't always cursed, right? But because you listened to your wife, and for those of you who may have forgotten the story, you remember that Eve was the one who went against God's commandment not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because of that, God is saying, now something is going to happen that's negative, It says, in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In other words, you have to eat vegetables. Now, if there are any kids out here who are are upset that you have to eat broccoli, blame Adam. It's his fault. (laughs) But no, we know that those green leafy vegetables, they have so many nutrients in them that help support our life in in this world, right? But God is saying, because things have changed now, Now things are not the way that they were intended to be. The ground now brings forth thorns and thistles. We're we're now into spring. We're starting to see the the, the new plants growing. It's amazing to me that in my garden, the weeds are growing faster than the grass that I'm trying to grow. I need need my friend uh, Mito to help me figure all of that out. But you don't have to try to grow weeds, do you? They just grow. But the good things, the the flowers, the roses, the vegetables, you have to work, you have to work. It's the same in our lives sometimes. The the character traits of goodness, patience, kindness, we have to work at them. But anger, frustration, selfishness, they just spring like weeds. It's not just the ground that experienced the curse. Even our own hearts have been broken by the sin that Adam and Eve let into our planet. It concludes in the sweat of your face, You will eat bread till you return to the ground. Translation, if you want to have a sandwich, you have to go to the gym. Oh, man. That part's so frustrating. I love the sandwiches. I don't like the gym as much. But but pray for me. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. In the sweat of your brow, you you will eat your food. And then it says, until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are, to dust you will return. It's so sad when we have a celebration of life, a funeral service for someone, and the last thing that the the priest or the minister, whoever says is what? Dust, ashes to ashes, what? 
dust to dust. No matter how good you are, no matter how great you are, we all seem to end in the same place. This is the ultimate evidence of this curse. This is not the way that things were designed to be, but this is how they are now. Okay, we're almost, we're almost finished. So, in spite of the hardships we, human beings, through Adam and Eve, brought on ourselves, God holds out a promise to the human race. What hope do we have to look forward to? Is this how the story ends? We just live and then we die and that's it? And endless rounds of this? Let's see what the Bible says. According to Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, it says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new what? God is going to do something to transform this broken, this cursed planet. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Some of you here have had the amazing experience or standing at the front of a church and seeing your bride walk to you down the aisle. It's an amazing thing. And some of you are wondering, how come she doesn't look like that every day? Listen, let me explain something to you, okay? Do you know the work it took? Okay. That was a, you you got to remember that in your mind and know that that's what it is. But the Bible is saying that one day when, when Jesus comes again and we see the new Jerusalem, it will be like that amazing thing of seeing something so beautiful, coming down uh, as a bride that went for her husband. It continues, and I heard a loud voice saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he, that's God, will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. I don't know if you've cried any tears in 2022. Maybe you've cried tears over the loss of a loved one. Maybe you've cried tears as you realize that your health is not what it used to be. Maybe you've cried tears as you've seen what's happening in Ukraine. And you say, God, is there any hope in this world? The Bible says, yes. One day, God will wipe every tear from our eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Can you imagine that? No more pain. You can go for a run and come back and still want to run again. Some of you, some of us, I don't say you, remember when you didn't have to make the dad noise before sitting down in the chair. Do you know about dad noise? There's a noise that dads make when they sit down. It's like, Oof. it's like, you know, just getting your bones ready. Remember when you didn't have to do that? One day again, and young folk who are laughing, listen, you, you live long enough, you'll get there. But God promises one day all of these things will pass away. He who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things what? New. And he said unto me, write for these words are true and faithful. Friends, this is the hope that we have, that one day God is going to make the world new and these challenges will be God. Okay, last, last question. Quite opposite to the ancient pagans, many of today's secular thinkers insist that we have a purely material essence. So we went from one extreme, all the, the, the main thing is the spiritual thing, and now in our world today we're on the other side, oh no, it's just the physical that's, that, that's all that there is. They say that we have a purely material essence without a spiritual component, and that the phenomenon of human existence emerged by chance through the dance of colliding atoms over billions of years. This perspective fails, however, to account for the emergence of consciousness. You know that you're here right now. Partly you know that because your stomach is reminding you that you're hungry or your body's reminding you that you're tired. I don't know what it might be, but we're aware of ourselves right now. How did consciousness emerge just from atoms knocking around? Self-awareness that allows human beings to contemplate their own existence. Do you ever look at your face in the mirror and see how it's changing? Your cat does not do that. Right? It's a very human thing to reflect on one's existence and to wonder about the meaning of life. Ecclesiastes 3.11 in mind, what kinds of things do people contemplate 
that seem to indicate that we are not here by accident. In what ways do you think we have eternity in our hearts? Here's the last verse. Speaking of God, it says, He has made everything beautiful when? In its time. Things are not always beautiful immediately. But the Bible promises in its time, God will make it beautiful. It says, also, He has put what? Eternity where? In their hearts. That means our minds, our consciousness. Human beings yearn for better, for more. Except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. The Bible tells us that God implanted, even in this world that is not yet fully beautiful, He put within us a desire for eternity. Can you think of any things or any experiences in life that point to this reality, that we have eternity in our hearts, that we desire more? As great as life can be, sometimes we yearn for more. Anyone ever had an experience like that? Yeah. I think all of us have a desire to live and exist. None of us want to go to our deathbed, right? Um, also, I think of just anyone that's got this explorative mind, we, well, we all have an explorative mind, from child, you know, from birth or childhood and on to adulthood, we're always wanting to learn things, to explore things. So if we never had a ceasing of life, imagine how much you could learn and explore. So that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, I think it just uh, like as a general thing, like in modern medicine, we're just trying to always extend our lives. You know, that's like the, always like the main, I guess, focus is like see like how far we can live. You know, that that never ceases to stop. That's so true. That's so true. And you know what's so interesting about this? If what modern science teaches is accurate, that all we are is just a collection of atoms, then why do we care when our life ends? Why do we seek to extend human existence? If, if we're just molecules bouncing around for a brief moment in the billions of years of the universe, why does it matter? But each of us know deep down in our hearts, you don't need anyone to tell you, you know that there's something special about life. I remember. About 10 years ago, this year will be 10 years, when my mom passed away. She was very young, 53. I'm 40 now. I'm getting closer to that age, and I sometimes worry about that. She was a young woman, and she was an amazing person. She, she gave us everything that we had. She taught us. She raised us. And we have the hope that one day when Jesus returns to make all things new, we will see her again. But yet, we wished, man... If we could have another week, another month, another year. I wish she had a chance to meet my amazing youngest daughter. She met her in the womb, but to meet her face to face. Sometimes I have questions. What should I do? And I want to ask someone, and she's not there. I have a hole in my heart. Something is missing. I'm not just missing a collection of atoms. I'm missing someone real. Neither am I like, well... She's just floating out there somewhere, and it's fine. No, 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 I miss the physical embrace. I miss the taste of her cooking. I miss the sound of her laughter. God has put eternity in our hearts, and that's when we, why when we lose people that we love, it hurts. Because somewhere in our souls, we believe this kind of love, even when on your worst day when you annoy me, but this kind of love is supposed to last forever. The good news is God has made a way to return things to that. We'll discover more about that in the moments to come. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. This is the end of our study. We invite you to come back tomorrow at 7 uh, p.m. when we will be on session two, Whisper of the Serpent. I'm fascinated to know what that is. Uh, as you leave, there is a book we would love to share with you. It's called Draining the Sticks which is a fascinating book by our presenter, Sean Boonstra, which tells more about these ideas. And there are also a few refreshments. And so if you would like to refresh yourself, do that. But by all means, stay by, uh, visit for a little while. Let's get to know each other. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to pray as we go uh, to end our time tonight. Let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you so much for being a God who is open to our questions and our ideas but also who through your word provides the truth that can help us to navigate 
challenging moments in our world. Life is wonderful, although life is often difficult. We have this desire for a better life, a longer life, a healthier life, better relationships in our hearts. No one has to teach us this. We, we naturally desire these things. And sometimes we search for these things in all kinds of things. Sometimes we search for them in relationships that, that turn sour. Sometimes we search for them uh, in, in, in achievements in this world, financial security, and then the stock market crashes and we lose that. But you are teaching us that in your word and in a relationship with you, we can find the thing that our heart longs for. So thank you for sharing this with us tonight. And we look forward to tomorrow when we will continue this journey. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Uh, like I said, stay by, get a book, and have some refreshments, and see you next time.